Uh, welcome to uh, another uh, INDELT webinar. As you know that INDELT refers to International Dialogue on English Language Teaching, and we try to aim, um, we try to provide online uh, seminars and webinars on various aspects of English language teaching. So INDELT is a joint initiative by the Department of Foreign Language Education at Burdur Mehmet Akif Ersoy University, Turkey, and the uh, Institute of Applied Linguistics at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan, Poland. And uh, we cooperate with Joanna uh, Kitzgas from the same university. Uh, as you know that uh, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in a week. And uh, we're going to share uh, the link for the YouTube channel uh, so that you can also watch the uh, previous webinars. And also the question and answer session will be held at the end of the webinar when all the uh, two speakers are finished with their talks. You can also use the chat box to share your questions and comments. And uh, alternatively, if you would like to ask your uh, questions in person, you can just uh, raise your virtual hand so that uh, we can uh, unmute you and ask your questions to the uh, speaker. And another important thing is that uh, is regarding the certificates. The link for the uh, certificates of attendance will be shared during the question and answer session. So we use a Google form to send you the certificate. So we kindly ask you to complete the Google form. And also there is an optional survey in the Google form. And uh, if you would like to share your uh, comments and suggestions, so you are uh, more than welcome to do so. Now, uh, let me introduce our first speaker today, uh, Professor Dr. Demet Yaylı. I would like to briefly introduce her to you. Demet Daile is a professor uh, in the Department of Foreign Language Education at Pamukkale University in Denizli, Turkey. She holds a PhD in the field of English language teaching. And after completing the PhD program, she spent a year in the Applied Linguistics program at Pennsylvania State University as a visiting scholar and was mentored by Dr. Suresh Kanagarajan. Her main research interests are L2 writing, genre-based writing, language teacher education, and professional identity formation of language teachers. Uh, dear professor, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, we would like to thank you again for agreeing to give your talk today. Hi, Ferit Hocam, thank you. Hi, Joanna, thank you. And I'd like to thank all the attendees today. Uh, who will listen to us and I will share my screen with you. Um, first, you know, I, I wanted to show you some pictures of the city where I live. I live in Denizli and Denizli is a lovely town in Turkey, in the east part of Turkey. Um, yeah, this is where I work, Pamukkale University. Pamukkale, Denizli is famous for Trevor Times. Uh, here you can see the, the, you know, this is one of the wonders of the world. So if you plan to come here, you can, this is the most famous trust attraction in my town. This is where I work. This is the Yalta program, the building, Faculty of Education. And here there is a, you know, we here in a presentation as a cup, you know, as a group of colleagues here. Okay, I will share my content. I don't want to lose time. And today I will briefly talk about, you know, my topic is about research article reading today and the challenges embedded in research article reading, especially for teachers. And first I will briefly talk about literacy, what literacy is, discourses, G's famous concern with discourses, his notion, membership into scholar, you know, for uh, scholars, how important it is to become memberships into certain discourse communities. I will talk about designing and I will pose a problem for you and I will suggest my solutions and then I will conclude. Is it okay now, Ferito Jam? Yes, everything is fine. Okay, is fine. so research article reading. So what kind of reading is this? You know, I, I was, you know, hoping to have an interactive kind of presentation today because you know, I don't like lecturing 
all the time I have here. I have 20 minutes, but I would rather hear your opinion. So maybe you can use the chat box or if you want to talk, you can just raise your hands and, you know, if you want sharing ideas for language teachers. We know that research article reading is a challenging task. By the way, I have been working in language education in the field of uh, English language education. And now it's mm, I've been here in this program for longer than a decade. And I always observe that teacher candidates, my students have problems reading research articles. So as a teacher educator, I feel that I have to share some research articles as a part of course, course packs or course requirements. But at certain times, I feel doubts about uh, how valid these research articles are for my students because they always complain about the validity. Anyway, so we know that in each academic community, there are certain expectations for the designs of the language used. So for us, the main purpose for human beings, the main purpose is to, to communicate with others. And while communicating, while performing certain social activities, we create certain social identities for ourselves and we try hard to belong to some of targeted social communities, discourse communities. So these two functions, I mean, communication and identity creation, meaning making are always connected to each other. So when we express our ex activities, we also reflect who we are, what kind of people we want to be. And in terms of our profession, what kind of teacher identities we should be creating, we should be, we should create so that we can belong to our desired groups. So for pre-service teachers, the language learned and practiced within teacher education programs via reading and writing is expected to prepare them for their targeted memberships. So their targeted memberships are mostly teachers, language teachers working in different parts of the country, but they want to belong to these, these groups. To exemplify, teacher education programs often use journal articles to provide novice teachers with the necessary professional knowledge. So they have to read certain uh, research articles uh, so that they can be prepared professionally. I mean, in terms of academic, academic knowledge and in terms of uh, being or learning how to behave in an appro appropriate ways, let's say. But first we should also pay attention to the concept of reading what reading is so we know that reading is not a very simple or easy act there are many challenges embedded in reading and according to Grabe and Stoller they are very famous scholars in the field of L2 reading they say reading is shaped by different dynamics such as the text itself the reader's background and the situation where reading takes place so Critical skills are necessary, especially in academia, uh, because we have to read and interpret messages carefully to be able to, to be able to be successful in reading. But there are other scholars who have touched upon the importance of literacy. For instance, Freer. Freer says literacy is not simply a process of acquiring and sharing information but it's a social and political consciousness literacy. He, he, he has a famous book, Reading the World and the World. So through reading the word, we also read the world. I mean, everything happening around us. So uh, as you see, I also personally take literacy as a social construct. I believe that human beings, while being engaged in academic reading and writing, they are also socially engaged. They have to pay attention to their social concepts, contexts, sorry, their social environments. 
And as teacher educators, we should also pay attention to our learners' needs so that they can have a critical stance toward the text they read within their education. So uh, as I told you earlier, G, Paul James G uses the term discourses with capital D to mention that uh, people use uh, languages in certain ways so that they sound uh, appropriate. I mean, he says, uh, he uses the term discourses with capital D for ways of combining and integ integrating language, action, interaction, ways of thinking, believing, valuing, talking, laughing. <laughs> you see, he sees it as a kind of identity kit and so that, you know, uh, a person can be considered as an appropriate teacher, appropriate dentist, appropriate lawyer. And connectedly, New London Group has a very famous publication on the design of meaning. So they emphasize the uh, importance of designing and redesigning meaning. So when we read academic texts, we do not just take the messages intact, but we give new meanings. We interpret what authors say. So this uh, available designs concept is also a good one for uh, reading and meaning making. So design for these people, New London Group, literacy educators and students, they say, must see themselves as active participants in social change as learners and students who can be active designers, makers of social futures. So for them, design is so crucial. So we should you know, pay attention to our students designing and redesigning needs of available meanings. Anyway, so this is the question I have in mind. You know, if research articles are designed in a certain way that is useful for researchers, can they still be useful for teachers? I can now, I cannot look at the chat box right now, but I will appreciate at the end, maybe you can, you know, share some of your opinions because we are running out of time. So I have to be quick, I guess. There are researchers uh, who have conducted studies on this question. And they see, for instance, Bartel says, teachers and researchers evaluate and use academic texts differently. Uh, because these two groups of readers have different ways of validating ideas in journal articles. They have different ways of using information in research articles. Similarly, Tavakuli and Howard, you know, conducted a study and they also came up with the uh, result that teachers and researchers' views are only sometimes similar. So they are most of the time different about the uses of research articles. Anvaruddin and Parvin uh, came up with the result that there is an absolute absence of teachers' research engagement for professional development in their country. So in Turkey also, once teachers are appointed as teachers to state schools, they don't need to do any kind of research. They don't need to be engaged in research uh, to keep their job or to be promoted, etc. So this is also criticized in some other studies like Simon Borg, for instance, I have met him some years ago in New York and he's famous for his studies on teachers lack of research engagement in different countries. But you know, we have to pay attention to local concerns and local realities of teachers and how they see, how they interpret research articles. So what I can say, you know, since in my country, 
you know, especially in the teacher education program where I work, I see that teacher candidates candidates always complain when I give them a research article. What they prefer is books, practice books, like Harmer's book, for instance, Penny Hur's book. They, these are their favorites. But when it comes to research article reading, many of my students who are teacher candidates are always complaining. They say, why do we have to read these? These texts are difficult, they are boring. There are lots of tables and statistics which we do not understand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, my solution, by the way, this presentation is, you know, I have taken some parts from a research study I conducted earlier, and the study is now under review. So I've just, you know, I've just taken some theoretical theoretical parts for you, but there are many things my students have told me about their struggles. Anyway, so what I suggest is to pay attention to these famous scholars' ideas like Kearns, G's, and New London Group's uh, principles, and we should see academic text reading from a different perspective. For instance, Kern, uh, he's, you know, he has published a book on the literacy, on the no notion of literacy, and he came up with several qualities of literacy. According to Kern, we have to be good at, in at interpretation, collaboration, conventions, cultural knowledge, problem solving skills, reflection and language use, so that we can be good at reading academic texts. Peritoja, I'm moving on. I hope I have some more time. Fine, no problem, Peritoja. So, according to Kern, interpretation is the first step. So when we read, we make meanings. We have to interpret appropriately. So this requires, again, certain apprenticeship. I mean, if you give teacher candidates a research article for the first time, when they are second or third year students, they feel shocked, you know, they, they say they lack certain skills. So for interpretation to be successful, students need some time for apprenticeship. I will skip my questions, maybe I can ask them at the end. Another thing, while I'm reading academic texts, we always talk with the writer in our minds because, you know, as Kanagaraja emphasizes writing is not a one-way transmission of ideas, but it's like a dialogue between writers and readers. And writers' intentions are always under the pressure of readers' expectations. <laughs> so we have to pay attention to this writer-reader relationships when we are reading a text. Uh, Another thing is conventions. <laughs> Students uh, must have certain ideas, must have certain familiarities with research article conventions. What kind of text they are, how they are written. Research article writing rules are also culturally determined because you know a research article published in English but in a national journal in Turkey, and then a research article still written in English but published in an international journal in Turkey might show certain differences. Another related concept is cultural knowledge. So we must have certain cultural knowledge about research article writing or the designs expected from writers so that as readers we can be better at interpretations. Another thing Kern says is we should pay attention to, we should pay attention to problem solving skills. So reading is problematic on its own, whether you're reading something academic or non-academic. So we should be good at figuring out relationships between words or between phrases, paragraphs, and the imagined worlds created. Also, academic reading is 
a process of reflection and self-reflection. So as readers, we at certain points, we have to reflect upon our successes and we must see, we must monitor ourselves, our qualities as readers. We should judge our success and we should, this is how we can solve our problems. I mean, if we can assess ourselves objectively, we can also figure out ways to solve our problems in meaning making. And the last important quality in reading is language use, of course. We are dealing with the language. We are L2 readers. Uh, we have to be good at uh, certain rules about writing systems, grammatical knowledge, but also we should be aware of the pragmatics. I mean, how language is used appropriately in different contexts. So we, we have to pay attention to appropriate use of language. Authors use some vocabulary and we should uh, create some sensitivities in learners. For instance, indicate, the verbs indicate, show, reveal. They may sound synonymous, but they are, they are different. There are some minute differences between these. So we should pay attention to authors' reasons behind their choices, why they choose one over the other. What is their reason? So we should create such language use sensitivities in our learners so that they can be better equipped in academic reading. So these are my humble personal tips or suggestions for this problem. First of all, we should see that there is a gap between communicative language teaching, which is very popular in Turkey, and advanced literacy teaching that is required in teacher education. How can we pay this attention? How can we become more aware of this gap first? More emphasis should be given to principles, these principles during teacher education so that teacher candidates may be uh, more equipped with the necessary literacy skills. Teacher, uh, teacher candidates should be given more chances to transform their available knowledge during their teacher, teacher education programs uh, because you know they cannot fully understand research articles without being engaged in producing one. And for any kind of such engagement, uh, language teacher candidates must be, first of all, exposed to good, relevant, meaningful research articles. This is one thing. How valid can they be? I mean, the problems studied in the research articles must be uh, suitable ones, valid ones for the teacher candidates, for instance. And also students, I mean, teacher candidates should be active in the reading and writing part. So they shouldn't be just naive or passive readers of research articles, but they should be allowed to work with some researchers, some teams with their teacher educators, uh, so that they can take part in uh, at least writing a research proposal or a conference paper so that they can have they can have this sense of uh, producing some research studies and they can see the meanings in research articles better this way because this is what new london group means with designing and redesigning available designs how through designing, through being actively participating into productions. So as I have summarized here, teacher candidates shouldn't be limited to the passive roles of being naive, naive readers of research articles, but they should be allowed to suggest research ideas, design some study proposals, and preferably be parts of some researchers 
teams. And now here at this point, we can also remember Koshun, Smith and Lytle's famous notion of teachers researcher movement. And according to them, according to these scholars, teachers must be researchers themselves because they are the experts of their own fields. They know their challenges very well. They are aware of all the realities of their sites. So instead of imparting, importing some uh, professor's research into their teaching sites, they should be carrying out their own studies. They should be active researchers who can produce remedies for their own problems better. So I have just skipped my questions, but if time allows, I can go back and I can get some of your opinions. Thank you, Ferito Jam. Thank you, Joanna Jam. I'm, you know, I will just stop my sharing. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Demeter Jam, for this uh, very informative presentation. By the way, some of the audience are asking if it is possible to share your PowerPoint. Sure, presentation. sure. So uh, you can also do, if you can send it to me, you know, I can, you know, share it uh, in the uh, chat. I will. Yeah, okay, thank you so much for that. Okay, now, and by the way, the uh, question and answer session is uh, at the end of the next talk, okay? And uh, if you would like to share your comments and suggestions, so you are uh, more than uh, welcome to do so. Okay, now uh, let's, let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Shema Akhtash. Uh, Shema Akhtash has been teaching English as a foreign language for about uh, 13 years. It's a preparatory program in a state university in Turkey. The courses she has given include uh, reading, writing, listening and speaking skills, core language and general English courses. She received her uh, BA degree from English language department at Dokuzeyli University, Turkey, and a master's degree from uh, ELT department at Pamukkale University. Currently, she's a PhD candidate at Pamukkale University and in the process of uh, writing her dissertation. Her academic interest areas are English language skills teaching, genre-based writing, and academic writing. Okay, Shema Ajam, the uh, mic is yours. Thank you, Ajam. Thank you so much. I would like to say good evening to you all. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with you, actually. Now I'm sharing my screen with you. I hope that you see my um, presentation at the moment. Is that okay? Yeah, everything is okay. Thank you so much. Good then, let me start my presentation. So um, as you said, I'm, I've been teaching English uh, in a preparatory program. So uh, I'd like to conduct this, uh, I wanted to conduct a study related to uh, this actually, and it's a kind of evaluation and program evaluation. So uh, I'll be giving details of this study to you tonight. And uh, today I'll be giving you some insights related to the concept of modular system and the, the, and the study related to the effectiveness of this modular system. So uh, I'll share you uh, some results of my study. Uh, first of all, let me introduce uh, uh, English preparatory programs in Turkey. Uh, these programs are specifically designed programs for the first year university student. Uh, before they enroll in their departments, students are uh, exposed to intensely designed language teaching curriculums in English. Uh, many of the students are uh, students from English medium departments, but also for uh, non-English medium departments, uh, students can choose uh, preparatory programs optionally. The mission of these programs uh, is to help students become proficient in English so that in their future life and career, they can use English both academically and non-academically. Uh, there are two systems or approaches in preparatory programs. The first one is progressive system and the second one is modular system. And in the, the progressive system is the most commonly used system in Turkey. It starts with a placement test in the beginning of the year and students are placed in their, uh, in their classes according to this test. 
and uh, in a linear way, they uh, move from one level to the another. And at the end of the year, they are given another proficiency. Uh, throughout the year, they, they are in the same class and they continue their education with the same instructor. On the other hand, the in the modular system, again, the year starts with a placement test in the beginning, but uh, it is not a yearly program. Education, English education is conducted through modules and there is a proficiency test at the end of each module. So the students didn't need to, don't need to wait at the, uh, uh, till the end of the year. If students cannot meet proficiency criteria, they need to uh, repeat the module actually. So this system allows for moving forward and back between the modules. And for each module, students are placed in a new class and they, uh, they see a new instructor. This system allows students to finish the program earlier. So this program doesn't have to um, last for one year. And this system is famous for being flexible and based on student level and performance. Uh, the aim of my study is to, to, to see uh, the effectiveness of the modular system because we started to apply this system in 2015, but before the modular system, we used the apply progressive system. So I just wanted to see uh, how my colleagues and students um, evaluate the system. What are their views on this? And I wanted to get the views of uh, my colleagues, instructors working there, the prep class graduate students and current prep class students, preparatory class students. But today uh, I'm going to share the results uh, that I gathered from instructors only because of time constraints. Uh, in the literature and in, in Turkish context, there are similar studies um, um, as in my study, they have this uh, similar aims actually. Uh, the, studies wanted to uh, find out the effectiveness of modular system. They want to see, they want to see if this system works or not. And uh, mainly the, these studies were conducted with uh, students and instructors. Uh, the data collection methods were generally um, questionnaires and um, interview interviews. And uh, when we look at the results of these um, studies in the literature, we see that depending on the context, uh, some uh, universities believe that the modular system is effective, um, but some other, some other uh, studies also show that there are some deficiencies in the system and it is not particularly useful. And when we look at Joshkun and all the studies, uh, they didn't find the modular system specifically uh, useful. Uh, in Joshkun study, the context of the university was affected in that because of the number of academic staff, classrooms, and teaching resources. And on the other hand, in Ter Terjans and Erarsan studies, uh, we see that modular system was highly effective, especially in Erarsan study, we see that um, modular system increased the academic success of the students. Actually, he um, compared the progressive system and the modular system. So I wanted to see the situation in my own institution. And let me talk about the research context, the, the plays um, that I conducted the research. This is an English preparatory program of a state university in a province in the west part of Turkey, actually Pamukkale University. Uh, the, we, we started to apply modular since uh, in 2015. We start the term with a placement test applied by testing and evaluation unit, and students are placed in their classes uh, depending on the, their levels as determined in CFR. In the first module, students can be either A1 level, elementary, or A2 pre-intermediate, or B1 intermediate. They start with one of these levels, and uh, after they start each level, they are given a proficiency test at the end of each module. In order to finish the program the com uh, completely, I mean successfully at the end, they need to be B1 plus level. And uh, in the program, it's possible that some students uh, can be given optional uh, B2 levels. Um, a typical model for each level, uh, let's have a look at that. Each module lasts eight weeks and students are exposed to a total of 20, 24 hours of English consisting of nine hours core language, which is the integration of skills, um, including language use, five hours writing skill, five hours reading skill, 
three hours speaking skill, two hours listening skill. And they are, the students are assessed through five quizzes for each language skill, a midterm exam, performance works, such as projects, homeworks, presentations, portfolios, etc., and a proficiency test. Uh, all of these um, assessment types are used in one module. And the success criteria to be able to pass to the next level, or to the next module, a student need to get an average score of 70 out of 100. And if a student cannot fulfill this criteria, that student has to repeat the same module. If a student repeats the second time, then the student is expelled for that academic year and restarts in the next one. So it creates some challenges for the students. Um, in order to make it uh, more clear, I'd like to um, talk about modal translation, transitions. If everything goes normal, a student start, uh, starting with an A1 level uh, goes to the uh, A2 level in the second module and B1 in the third module and B1 plus in the fourth module. So um, an A1 level student should be, um, should never repeat any classes in order to finish the year successfully. But A2 level students, starting with A2 level uh, students, uh, they can finish earlier in the third module. And if they like, they can get B2 level optionally, or they can just uh, wait for the term finish. B1 level students even can finish earlier because the desired level is B1 plus. So it is possible that they can finish their education at the end of the second module if everything goes normal. But if students cannot um, show any progress in the, at the end of the module, they need to go into the repeating classes. So uh, in this study, originally there were three groups actually. The first group consisted of 10 instructors. The second group, 10 students who successfully completed the program. And third group, 15 students who are still in uh, the second module of the program. Uh, I'm not going to give the details of students part because uh, I'll share the results from the instructors part. Um, these 10 instructors teach uh, various skills and levels within the modular system. They have several, uh, they have some re administrative responsibilities. Among these 10 instructors, we have one vice director of the school, two vice heads of the department, material unit coordinator, testing and evaluation unit coordinator, education support coordinator, two testing and evaluation unit members. Uh, so this part, uh, these responsibilities um, are important in this study because um, they know how the system works and they are aware of the issues related to the modular system because of their responsibilities, uh, administrative responsibilities, as well as teaching. So the data was collected um, last year during the pandemic times, actually. That's why uh, I, I just um, tried to reach many people, but it, that, that's a limitation. I couldn't get a lot of data. I try to collect data through semi-structured opinion, opinion forms through digital platforms like email, WhatsApp, Instagram applications. And um, the forms were uh, analyzed qualitatively and content analysis method was used. Okay, let me share the find, uh, findings with you now. As a result of the study, the strengths and weaknesses of the program were unearthed from the uh, viewpoints of both participating students and instructors. Now I'll be sharing instructors' views and suggestions on modular system. First of all, um, I came up with some strengths of the modular system um, from instructors' point of view. These uh, are dynamism, keeping students alert, motivate, uh, the system motivates, encourages students to pass the next module. The system makes students study more regular, more and regularly. We see the active attendance of students in this system because it's performance oriented. And instructors also said that uh, with modular system, we have more clear and concise learning objectives. Uh, in this, um, the data shows that the majority of the instructors were in favor of the modular system and they believe that uh, the pro the, the, this approach was uh, compatible with the learning goals of the preparatory program. And the, all of the instructors uh, talked about uh, the dynamic dynamic issue because um, it, it, it is flexible, uh, it allows for different changes for students. 
So we can see this from teachers, instructors, um, sentences also. Um, all right, let me talk about weaknesses of the modular system. Um, all of the teachers also talk about heavy workload this system and the system create heavy workload for both teachers, administrators and students. And because uh, it is important to assign students and teachers to classes four times a year, normally in progressive system, um, this happens only for one time. Students are placed into their classes and teachers are assigned to those classes and it finishes there till the end of the year. But this happens uh, four times in the modular system. And um, some teachers also uh, focused on the issue of time constraints to catch up with the syllabus because each module is limited to eight weeks, which means that um, teachers need to catch up with the syllabus in that uh, time limit. And this is specifically difficult for upper level groups, B1 and B1 plus groups, because their syllabus is um, includes a lot more topics than A1 and A2. That's why a little bit the challenging for teachers. And here we also observe less student-teacher interaction because uh, after eight weeks, all classes change depending on the model proficiency exam. Students um, come into new classes, they encounter new teachers. So teachers say that whenever they uh, get used to a class, uh, they are familiar with students, then the classes need to change because of the, because the end of the module comes. So uh, this is uh, stated as a limitation. Also, um, the system was found demotivating for repeating students, especially for, for lower level students, because if an A1 level student repeats for one time, it means that the student needs to, need to um, go on to the next year to finish the program because he or she cannot see B1 plus level. Uh, so uh, there is no way for uh, A1 student to repeat or other students, whenever they repeat one class, their motivation seems getting lower. So let's look at the um, some uh, example statements from the uh, teachers. Uh, instructor one is actually one of the vice directors of the uh, program. Just a second. Okay. Uh, implementing a modular uh, approach requires large initial workload for teachers uh, as it involves a considerable investment of time, preparation, and energy. And instructor two, also, um, again, the, the vice head of the department says that. For the management, assigning lecturers in each module from scratch takes time and it happens four times a year. For the coordinating unit who is responsible for designing the classes, it also takes extra time to reshape the classes for each module. About the student workload, um, in order for students not to fall behind the syllabus and reach the learning outcomes, students need to perform extracurricular activities and must attend courses regularly. As the modules last eight weeks, they shouldn't miss any content. Also, since in the modular system, there are frequent exams within eight weeks, they should be prepared all the time. And if you remember, I said one of the teachers was not in favor of the uh, modular system. Uh, she, she's against the idea of modular system. So uh, we can summarize her ideas here. She says that I think the modular system is not a suitable system for one year preparatory education because the students have to progress very fast and the syllabi are very intense. Students have to hurry a lot to catch up with it and not to fall behind. And students take the midterm exam in the fifth week before they even understand what is happening. So th this is the part of system. In the eighth week, they start midterm, and in the eighth week, they get the proficiency. And even starting from the third week, they start the quizzes. And the syllab syllabi are so intense that one moves on to another, one before any subject or skill is sufficiently internalized. Therefore, neither the syllabi goals, goals nor the expected outcomes can be reached. An eight-week module is quite short. It certainly does not give the students time to understand, comprehend what they have learned and produce. So it seems that there are some positive points of the system and also some deficiencies related to the system. Uh, it's not possible to be
Hocam, can you hear me? Yeah, it's okay. I think you were, you know, muted for for a second or so. Okay. Okay. So I continue. Please. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, also, uh, there were some suggestions from the teachers related to the uh, system. Uh, let me. Sorry, I cannot see the screen clearly. Just a second. Okay. Uh, these suggestions were mainly related to the duration of each module and related to skill distribution and they weigh in uh, lesson hours. Um, because many of the teachers believe, uh, the majority of the teachers believe that an eight weeks was uh, short, uh, a short period for um, B1 and B1 plus level. So it should be changed. And the duration could be shorter for A1 level since they already know about basic concepts such as colors, numbers, fruits, and vegetables. More time could be allocated for the other levels. And another suggestion was like this. Modular system works well, especially in lower levels. For A1 and A2 classes, the allotted time is quite enough, but for higher levels, it's fairly difficult to reach predetermined objectives. In those levels, at some point, it just turns into presenting the subject and leave the rest for students for B1 and B1 plus level. For instance, it is better to double up the time, but unfortunately we don't have such a time and it is not easy to change. Also about the uh, skill distribution, Instructor 8 uh, had an interesting idea. Um, she said that in my opinion, there should be um, no productive skills in lower levels, especially in A1. Students should be equipped with grammar, vocabulary, reading and listening at first, then in A2 they should start writing and speaking in a very controlled and limited way. Following that in B1 and B1 plus we can now ask for more productive skills. And another idea was, suggestion was that uh, we can lessen the hours of grammar classes instead, we can design independent speaking or writing activities in form of clubs or mini talks or writing contests. So looking at all these um, findings, we can say that it's possible to find some um, strengths and weaknesses in the system. And um, time also seems here a big constraint for the modular system. And um, it's possible to make use of uh, literature, literature studies to develop this system. And maybe some eclectic approach can be benefited in this preparatory programs, both applying modular system and yearly system, something mixed. I mean, the number of uh, module can be, um, for example, lowered like two modules or three modules. Uh, so, the time can be adjusted accordingly. So here, uh, I just tried to have some ideas related to the modular system applied in my own institution. I hope that um, it's, I, I could give you some uh, insights related to that issue, the concept of modular system and some ideas related to that. Uh, that was all about me, actually. Thank you for listening. And um, if you have any suggestion, it, it is okay for me. And your questions are welcomed. So uh, Shayma Hocam, thank you so much for this uh, informative presentation and talk. Uh, Joanna, okay. So. Yes, thank you very much um, that our both presenters. Can you hear me? Um, is it okay with my connection? Can you hear me? Y yes, we can. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, great. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, and um, I think we can start um, our question and answer uh, section. So again, if you have any question, you can either uh, write your question in a chat box or uh, just raise your virtual hand I, and I can see already some uh, some hands here uh, and ask your uh, question personally. Uh, so I think we can start uh, with Dr. Philly, Philip Calloway. Could you, um, because you were the first one. Um, and uh, yes, uh, very, uh, I think, um, uh, is it possible? Yeah, no, to, to unmute. Okay, so for Philip, right? Okay. Yeah, hi, Ferry. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? 
Yeah, thank you, uh, ladies, for your interesting talk. So both are uh, equally as interesting. However, I've only got the one question for Seema. Um, so Seema, um, I, I liked I liked uh, your 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 concept. Um, my question is. Uh, the, the one piece right the, right at the end you said about you know that we you should move off the grammar and start to you know it's almost stop learning the language start using it to learn you know stop learning it to use use it to learn what at what stage do you think may be best to you know or when we should be you know thinking right we're not teaching grammar anymore they're stepped into the university first year freshmen should they be studying grammar at that level when do you think it should you know, grammar should be stopped, or is it individual students? What do you think? Thank you for your nice uh, command and uh, question. Actually, this is yeah. something that we discuss in our um, institution as well, uh, because um, in Turkey, grammar is so popular, actually. We, we have strong connection with teaching uh, grammar about that. Uh, it's not easy for us to, um, I mean, be away from grammar teaching, actually. But um, there are two ideas about this. First, um, it, in, in the first week, it is better to, uh, not to deal with grammatical issues in the very beginning. Students can be uh, just exposed to language skills uh, as much as possible, especially reading and listening. And then um, they, 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 they are uh, exposed to language structures but uh, not explicit grammar teaching at that time. Maybe they can be given uh, explicit grammar teaching uh, toward the upper levels. This is one view actually. Um, on the other hand, the other, uh, we have another view in our institution that it is, it is like this, uh, giving grammar structures in the very beginning with the low level of students and then just doing skill-based activities in the upper levels. So A1 and A2 classes will include um, listening, uh, reading courses together with language, explicit language teaching, and, um, and B1 and B1 plus with a lot of skill practice. Uh, actually, I'm somewhere between these two. My personal opinion is that I think it's better to deal with language structure towards uh, upper levels, maybe at the end of A2, uh, because in the very beginning, uh, students should be exposed to language as much as possible. Right, yeah, I, that's, it's, it's, it, you're the, one of the first persons that I've ever actually heard say that you should be tackling grammar at that age, you know, which is like, they, everybody starts with grammar, don't they, in the alphabet, the grammar, and, and yet it's ironic that you actually say, well, no, let, let them be like, so intermediate level or something like that, yeah? Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. I, I sort of go with that because if they've done some reading, then they can see the structure and hopefully, you know, and sort of, and then you just put a name to it. So yeah. anyway, thank you, Seema. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Ferry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, the next person with a uh, question. I'm sorry for my, okay. yes, for my pronunciation. Uh, we have the lady here. Um, Okay. Yes, I am Rukmining Singh from Indonesia. Good morning from Indonesia. Um, Hello, I want to, great to have you. Can you hear my voice clearly? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, uh, I want to share with Prof. Uh, Dimit Yoli, is it right? <laughs> my pronunciation. Yes, okay. okay. Uh, yes. I am teaching uh, critical reading and also teaching uh, proposal writing. So I think almost similar with Prof. Yali, yeah, uh, dealing with a research article reading. Actually, that I want to share my experience when I teach my students, candidate teacher, I mean, uh, dealing with uh, how to write a proposal writing. But before that, in the semester, I also teach uh, critical reading. Here, uh, I I give uh, some tips to for my students to make uh, to make uh, the them better to write the proposal proposal draft. So uh, when I teach critical reading, I employ high order taking skills for the critical reading. So it means that uh, I ask my students to uh, analyze, evaluate, synthesize, and creating uh, for uh, some research articles. 
So it means that uh, when they come to the class, I before they come to the class, I ask them to read uh, the similar topics that I want to discuss. For example, uh, about flip classroom, for example, the article about the uh, flip classroom. So I mm -hmm. asked to my students to read uh, dealing with, uh, with flip classroom, anything sources. So when they come to the class, so they, can, uh, they will have a prior knowledge, a lot of prior knowledge from the a uh, lot of article, research articles. So it means that they can synthesize, they can synthesize, they can evaluate the uh, the research article. So it means that uh, it will be better for them to have uh, their ideas, to share their ideas, and also to write the proposal, uh, the proposal writing from their background knowledge by uh, employing the critical reading, critical reading skills. So it means that they are ready. Yes, they are ready to write their proposal by a lot of uh, uh, mm -hmm. prior knowledge or uh, I have to activate, activate their uh, content schema in order to... Right. Uh, so they get, earn both yes. rhetorical knowledge, I mean, how to design a research proposal and content knowledge. I mean, what information to include, what ideas, what background uh -huh. is required. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Great, okay. I mean. Yes. Okay. So I think uh, they, they will get a better and better for their writing because uh, in critical sure. reading, they used to, uh, I think they are accustomed to, to, uh, to think about how to analyze, how to evaluate, evaluate and synthesize and also create, uh, of create something. Create something, it means that they can summarize by using uh, synthesizing uh, some of previous studies. So this is That's a great uh, example. Thing. Thank you. So your okay. students do reading, not only yes. for ideas, content, background, theoretical yeah. knowledge base, but they do reading to learn the design, genre, how to write a research proposal, what features to pay attention to. That's lovely. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. a good example. This is how they raise their critical thinking skills as well. Yeah. Yes, of course. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this good example. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And we have uh, one more question from our audience, Antonio Constantino Suarez. Uh, Oh, well, thank, uh, thank you for the first speaker and the second speaker. It, it was a great presentation. And my, uh, my question for Isema, the, sec the, the second presenter. Uh, in your presentation, you, uh, you said that uh, you apply qualitative in your paper. On the other hand, when I when I saw your the technique of data data collection, there is a questionnaire. So uh, if we see carefully research methodology written by the Creswell, that the questionnaire is the one of the techniques that belong to quantitative. So uh, because you told us that you apply qualitative methodology. Uh, as we know that the observation, the interview, group discussions, they are the techniques of data collection belong to qualitative. So would you mind uh, more explaining again about the methodology of your data collection? Uh, if I may be wrong, please criticize me, Vanessa. And uh, thank you. That's all about my, my question. Thank you. Okay. Um... I didn't use any uh, questionnaire in my uh, study, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a semi-structured um, opinion form. It was like that. Uh, I didn't use any questionnaire or scale. Uh, I just gave some examples from literature. And in the studies uh, uh, that I gave as examples in, from the literature, they used some um, questionnaires or other techniques. But mine was um, semi-structured interview form. So it is a qualitative uh, study. Uh, I just uh, try to get uh, opinions of our teachers uh, in depth opinion, to have in depth analysis of their opinions. I try to came up with some uh, teams uh, together with a rater, another rater, 
And today I just show you some example sentences from the, the instructor, but uh, I didn't know, I didn't have any kind of numeric or statistical um, issue in my data. That's why it's a qualitative study, not quantitative, because I didn't apply any questionnaire or other scales. I hope that it is clear. So I think uh, Shema, uh, he is muted. Just a second. Mm -hmm. um, right. Okay. Uh, Antonio, can you hear yes, us? Sir. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I hope that my uh, answer is clear. Yeah, um, clear. Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you, Shema. You know, it is interesting. And uh, hopefully we, uh, this kind of program is a webinar is a continuously conducted and sharing. You know, uh, we are from Timor-Leste, this is a small country. And we, we just, uh, next month will be our 20 restoration after being uh, independent. So uh, literacy, the, uh, you know, reading and writing for this time being is uh, become the most difficult for our countries for this time being. So through this kind of the webinar, I do believe that the, as a teacher, I can, uh, I can collect this, uh, this webinar and share to some, some friends of mine who also, uh, also teach at university because you know, we are in the same, the same boat. I teach linguistic, especially for morphology and syntax for, uh, for institute. So thank you, Seema, it's a nice presentation. Okay, and also for our professor, Professor Davis, you know, it is interesting about literacy and then hopefully you two ladies can uh, share the slides for us and then all the participants can read. And then again, so just thank you. Assalamualaikum, Seema. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we have another participant uh, who would like to ask uh, a question. Uh, there's, there's two Ali, I think. Yes. yes. I would like yes. to say thank you for those nice speak, speakers. They had nice presentations. We really, we are lucky for having them. I have a question for the next second speaker, Shaima Akhtash. Uh, you said in the modular system, we have, if students face, let's say, fail, failed in the proficiency test, they should retake the class again. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, somehow sort of demotivated, demotivated students. And this notion, you, you just raised it in the weaknesses of this module. So what's your modest opinion for this group of people, or let's say students? Uh, for uh, okay, actually, this is teachers' uh, work generally to motivate students again. Whenever I enter, uh, whenever I teach those repeating class students, we try to um, uh, we, we try to encourage them to study more because uh, we believe that this they they, uh, they couldn't meet um, the the desired level. So it is normal. We we try to calm them down first of all to motivate them again and. Uh, this is mainly teacher's work, but also uh, we try to open some summer courses for those students so that uh, they can improve their deficiencies and um, they do not have to repeat the year and start again uh, in the preparatory class next year. And also we try to um, make plans for them, study plans, so that they can cover their uh, deficiencies but in the very beginning in the first weeks of the module uh, when they repeat the class it's a little bit difficult for us because they de they even want to uh, uh, drop out I mean drop out of the program and then uh, we have some attendance problems with those students and so it's a really important issue to encourage them again to motivate them again to enter the, to, to come to lessons and uh, actually this is something some personal effort uh, from the teachers and um, 
I don't know, but if you have some suggestions to do uh, to, to do for these uh, demotivated students, I would do. Uh, I, I would actually like to hear that. What we do is just personal uh, encouragement from the teachers and some courses that we can plan. Okay, so uh, I have unmuted uh, Ali. Mark. Okay. Most probably, yeah, that's right. But I think if if they studied the same material, it's somehow boring for them. If we gave them extra material, it's gonna be very beneficial for them. This is my suggestion. Do not repeat the same let's say, syllable, the same topics that they already studied. Just give them extra work, and it, it might be suitable for them. Yeah, thank you for reminding. Actually, that, that, that's uh, something that I forgot. Our material office, we have a material unit that supports the education and uh, they are trying to feed us with a lot more um, resources and they, try, they are trying to provide extra sources for these repeating class students. Although we have some uh, same materials, we also have extra ones actually, but that, that's a really good uh, idea, suggestion. Thank you so much for that. So thank you so much for the questions and of course for the responses. Uh, Johanna, before we end the session, I would like to share uh, an invitation for the conference, if you allow me to do so. Right. Okay, yeah. Yes, so, uh, please do. All right. Please do. Um, also, um, by the way, if you have any, um, any um, uh, information about our conferences you would like us to share, uh, do not hesitate. We would like to be a kind of platform to exchange uh, not only pra good practice, but also, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, we can hear you clearly, right? Yes, I, I just wanted to say that that uh, we would like our participants to, to actively co-create with us this um, this webinar. So if you want us to, to share some uh, some uh, call for papers, uh, do not hesitate. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure for that. Okay, so um, uh, th this is the announcement for the conference entitled Seventh International Conference uh, in Kratoshin. Poland uh, between the 7th and 9th of September uh, this year, of course, and uh, the conference will be uh, both, you know, on site and uh, it would be also, uh, you know, virtual and it will be uh, hosted by Marek Rabietz, uh, our colleague uh, in Poland, and I would like to share also the link if you would like to have uh, further information uh, regarding the conference. Uh, you can check the uh, chat box for that, and also um, uh, you will also have the link in in, in the email uh, in in which will include the certificate of attendance. So thank you so much. Again, uh, I would like to thank uh, Demet Ojan for your you know very informative presentation and Shema Ojan for your uh, great contributions to the webinar. Uh, we really appreciate that. Joanna? You're welcome. Thanks for inviting us. Sure. It was our pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your, your great and inspiring presentations. And thank you for, for making co-creating co our, our webinar with us. Thank you. Thank you also to all participants that you are with us from so different parts of the world. It's it's great that some of you uh, uh, woke up in the middle of night to, to listen to our great presenter. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you and see you in, in the next webinar. Thank you so much. <laughs>